so I'm presenting this morning on uh, the work that we did through the Prevent Ovarian Cancer Program. In terms of disclosures, I have worked on advisory board meetings with uh, AstraZeneca, and I won't be discussing any off-label or investigational use. Um, I hope at the end of this uh, brief uh, presentation that you'll be familiar with some of the novel strategies that we use to identify at-risk women for ovarian cancer, the rates of mutation that were identified in these first-degree relatives, and some of the challenges that are associated with the identification of at-risk women. So we know that high-grade serous ovarian cancer is a highly lethal yet preventable strategies uh, do exist in the management of this disease. And identifying women who are at risk has to be a, a critical importance in the overall management of this disease. We also know that the historical rates of identification of BRCA1 and 2 mutations in women that had ovarian cancer over the years was very poor. And there's a lot of published data of that, including Canadian data. <clears throat> Many of the first-degree relatives of people who have passed away from ovarian cancer who they themselves had not gotten tested would not be eligible for provincially funded genetic testing programs. So we were left with the question of how can we identify these women who may be at risk and uh, what is their risk um, if we identify them. So in 2015, we launched an Ontario-wide uh, campaign for the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. And the idea was to recruit female first-degree relatives of women who died of ovarian cancer that they themselves had never been tested. There were two methods of recruitment that were initially planned. The first one was an outreach program. And this program involved us using uh, grassroots uh, messaging systems, uh, trying to get the message out there. We had a modest um, um, advertising uh, budget. Um, and the idea was really to identify people and invite them into the program. The other approach was a direct targeting approach. And the idea here was that we had obviously a large percentage of, of people that were treated for ovarian cancer at Princess Margaret that we knew died of the disease and also had not been tested and to actually um, go after the families of these individuals. When the program started in 2015, we were not allowed to take a direct targeting approach. It was felt due to privacy concerns. Legal department of our institution told us not to do that. In 2017, we re- um, explored this as an option with some of the initial data that we had, and the uh, REB did change their uh, mind on that um, and allowed us now to uh, directly target individuals. That process didn't actually get started into 2018. The data that I'm presenting today, for the most part, deals with the outreach program. The outreach uh, process was reasonably simple. The message was, was, was very simple to get out there. If either your mother, sister, uh, daughter uh, died of ovarian cancer and they themselves had never been tested, um, please come to the website and then the, all the information will be there. It was a real a credit to the people that put together the information on the website. When we put this together, we were obviously worried we would get a uh, a flurry of people who, who you know, their, their relatives didn't die of ovarian cancer, may be some other type of cancer. But in fact, the eligibility question that the vast majority of people that participated were in fact eligible. When we put the design together, we wanted to have pathology reports. We wanted to uh, hone in on that high-grade serious population to maximize the identification of individuals. Um, I will talk uh, later on in the presentation. We did include individuals in some cases where we did not have pathology if the story was convincing for high-grade serous. The patients were given questionnaires. We did a modified pretest counseling that has been presented at the GOC last year and has since been published. And certainly as part of the program for those that we identify at risk, we try to facilitate risk-reducing surgery if age appropriate. You can see here um, the genes uh, on the bottom of that table. Those are the genes are on the panel. This was not a uh, panel that was created specifically for our program. This was a panel that in, back in 2015 was available through Princess Margaret. When this program started, only BIN A, which is BRCA1 and BRCA2, were really seen as actionable genes related to ovarian cancer. And so participants had the option of how much information they wanted to know. And we divided the information into four bins, A, B, C, and D. Um, as time has gone on, we now know that most provincial agencies and genetic testing that goes on is no longer simply BRCA1 and BRCA2, but rather a panel-based testing. So as part of the analysis, we subdivided um, uh, the results in those that would match into what we would see as a clinical-based panel uh, that is used uh, today. 
in terms of the participants, and we do have some data on the direct targeting approach, but the vast majority are from the outreach approach. You can see that the median age of the participants is 53. Also, the median age of the uh, first degree relative of the diagnosis of their ovarian cancer uh, was comparable between the two groups. There were more Italian patients in the direct targeting approach, probably reflective of the population um, in Toronto. When we did the outreach program, it was mostly outside of the GTA that we did in Ontario. You can see the majority of patients had only a single case of ovarian cancer in the family. It was the first degree relative that had passed away. And the Bodicea score, for those that may not be familiar, is a scoring system. It's a research tool that's used out of the University of Cambridge to identify what someone's risk would be based on their history. Um, and you can see that in both cases, it's significantly lower than the 10% cutoff that most agencies use. The data is, is uh, presented here uh, on the uh, far left as the overall patient population. And then in the middle, if the first degree relative was under the age of 50 at diagnosis, and the last one is if the um, age was over 70 at the age of diagnosis. The first thing that uh, certainly struck us was that the BRCA mutation rate in the overall population was low at 2.6%. We certainly were expecting a higher number there. When we look at the clinical gene panel, it is slightly higher at 5.8%. But I do think that when we talk about mutation rates, uh, there is a lot of data that's out there, and it's possible that some of the stuff that we're getting may be uh, higher than, than it actually is in, in the real world. In terms of that patient population, however, where the first degree relatives was under the age of 50, you can see that the clinical gene panel rate of mutation was 11.9%, and that certainly is considered high. Remember, these are not affected people. These are family members of people that were uh, <coughs> affected. You can see there's a quite a, a high percentage also of variants of undetermined significance. We have not counted those when we talk about the actual pathogenic mutation rates. It's also worth noting that in the patient population where the first degree relative was over the age of 70, we still are identifying a 4.3% rate of mutation in the clinical gene panel. So we probably shouldn't discard those um, individuals. Uh, this table uh, breaks it down based on the incidence of ovarian cancer and breast cancer in the family. Again, the majority of cases, there was a single case of ovarian cancer in the family. And as would be expected, if there were more than two cases of ovarian cancer, we'd have a higher rate of uh, pathogenicity in terms of the genes that were identified, 8.7% um, on the clinical gene panel. Um, again, we were somewhat surprised at this. You would think with two family members of ovarian cancer that that number, again, should be higher. Um, and Again, I think it may be just reflective of the patient population in the outreach program, which is where this data is coming from. This breaks down uh, the participants based on the pathology. Again, we, uh, when we put this together, we really wanted to capture high-grade serous ovarian cancer. We understood, obviously, the challenges early on. Uh, some of these participants, they had their cancer over 10 years ago, and the pathology and the understanding of the pathology has changed over time. We had uh, um, uh, pathologists um, as part of the program review certain cases and did include certain cases that were not serous. And again, as mentioned, we included cases that we didn't have pathology, but the participant really gave a good story that their mother or, or loved one had ovarian cancer. And what's interesting is that we did find an 8.5% mutation rate in that patient population. So in strategies around identifying at-risk women, it may be wise not simply to focus on the pathology itself. This slide really represents uh, what I would describe as preliminary data, as mentioned. This is uh, only with 22 uh, participants. But in the uh, preliminary data that we're getting, it would appear that the mutation rates are going to be higher. And that's not surprising. Uh, one of the things that we found, uh, we know that ovarian cancer is what would, in some way could be considered a rare disease. Um, and when you're trying to use a strategy in terms of a whole population base, certainly in Ontario, uh, we probably are identifying in some ways lower risk individuals and by a targeted approach, we may in some ways be, be targeting those that may be slightly higher risk. Um, and, but we'll have to see when the results of the targeted approach come out. So to conclude, we do feel that this program was successful in identifying at-risk women. We had a lower than expected rate of BRCA1 and 2 mutation, but certainly the patient population where the FDR uh, was under 50 at the time of diagnosis, we had a 12% rate of mutation as a clinical gene panel testing. The uh, preliminary rates in the direct approach appear to be higher. I would like to uh, finish with one slide to say that um, there are a lot of challenges, even with the targeted approach, which we thought would solve a lot of our issues in terms of that wide net. This is kind of an algorithm that the REB gave us to make sure that we're correct, we're contacting the correct Joan Smith and not some other Joan Smith. 
and over 60% of our cases end in a dead end. So there are challenges even when we know the families that are out there. I think I was just on time there, Greg. Were you impressed with that? I was, I'm impressed with that. Set, um, the, set the bar. Uh, this, uh, this, this couldn't be done without a huge team. Obviously, the entire team at Princess Margaret had been completely supportive of all the clinicians um, and really a, um, a large uh, network of individuals to, to secure funding uh, to get this program going. And on a personal note, um, when you have an individual who you've identified at risk and they undergo a risk-reducing surgery, you feel you've really made an impact even if it's a small number of people. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions. I'm just going to start off. Um, how did you, with your outreach approach, how did, do you know of how women identified in certain categories, like what was felt to be one of the better ways that they were able to identify? Um, well, again, the message was very simple. Um, yeah. If they had a first degree relative, and we left it broad. I mean, we didn't even give specific instructions. Uh, again, we were expecting, and I think what we noticed, and I didn't present this data, we had a lot of hits on the website. Okay. And then once people initially looked at the information, they would see, you know what, this isn't for me. And those that went to the next phase of it, a lot of them, again, met that initial eligibility, eligibility criteria. Excellent. Thanks, Marcus. It's uh, been an amazing project. I just have a question. So it's 2.5% of the overall population per pathogenic BRCA. So the other ones were on the panel. So what bins did they fall into? The high associated, uh, like the, PM, uh, the MMR and the um, BRIP1 and RAD51C, or what bins were they in? Like so, for clinical significance. And yeah, so the, in the clinical gene panel, they are incorporating, for the most part, the bin 2. Some of the bin 3, I think, were also on that panel. Um, it's um, my understanding, and I'm, I'm not the one that put the clinical panel together that they use, but all of those have some degree of actionability to it. So, so the eight point something percent were all actionable. Actionable, correct. With, okay. Other questions? Um, what kind of costs, Marcus, are associated with these different programs, uh, especially the direct? Is there do you have any idea of the cost at this point? Or? So one of the things that we're uh, trying to do with the directed program is to actually test the tumor of the affected individual because obviously if that's negative, we can avoid then testing six family members from the same individual. Um, you know, the testing is still around $1,000 uh, per test. That's kind of, I think, pretty standard everywhere. Um, and that makes up the majority of the cost. Um, in terms of the outreach program and how to get this message out there, um, you know, we did call Angelina Jolie. We thought if she said a few words, people would pay attention, but we didn't get, she didn't answer the call. Really? Uh, even from you? I can't. I'm surprised. <laughs> um, but anyway. Um, so, I mean, we had a very modest budget. It's hard, it, I'll tell you, there's a lot of expense to get messages out there these days, yeah. and we, try, we did try to use social media and such, but, you know, it's such a small message in a, in a sea of, of things that go on uh, for, for individuals. So. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ashley Warius. I'm one of the PGY2s here in Halifax. And I'm very happy today to have an opportunity to present a research project that we've worked on over the last two or three years now, uh, entitled Timely Access to Genetic Counseling for Epithelial Ovarian Cancer in Nova Scotia. Um, our project was funded by AstraZeneca, so I'll disclose that up front. But we will not be making any therapeutic <coughs> recommendations or any off-label recommendations for medications. I have two learning objectives for you today. First and foremost, to look at how implementing a new model of care here in Nova Scotia has actually significantly increased our referral of epithelial ovarian cancer to genetic services. And secondarily, to look at patient preferences around the timing for genetic counseling. The average lifetime risk for all kind of Canadian women uh, is 1.4%, and that statistic comes from the most recent uh, Canadian Cancer Society statistics in 2018. We see roughly 2,800 new diagnoses of epithelial ovarian cancer in Canada annually. And in Nova Scotia, our rates are around 70 new cases per year. We know that germline mutations in BRCA1 and 2 are very well established in hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, and that both confer a significantly increased risk compared to the average population. 
And depending on what literature you're reading, the rates of germline mutation in this population is anywhere from 13 to 16 percent, uh, with high-grade serous mut uh, subtypes having a particularly higher rate, um, up to 22 percent. And we also know, uh, this is a study by Petzl et al., that um, up to 44% of women actually have no family history, despite potentially testing positive for a germline mutation. So if we can identify women at risk, what can we do about preventing the development of, of ovarian cancer? So we can offer them risk-reducing surgery in the form of prophylactic BSO or mastectomy. We can also identify other individuals within that family who may similarly be positive for a mutation and then subsequently offer them risk-reducing strategies. And if we have women that have already developed an ovarian cancer who may be BRCA1 or 2 positive, we now also have PARP inhibitors available for the recurrent uh, ovarian uh, cancers in this population. And so all of these uh, methods really hinge on having a robust genetic testing system and allowing women to have access to that system. The types of women that we're seeing referred have also changed over time. So initially, the criteria used to be quite stringent. You had to have one or two first-degree relatives. You might have had to have had a previous history um, of breast cancer yourself or be of an ethnicity that was known to be at higher risk. And the criteria used to also be quite stringent in terms of age, where only women less than 60 were being referred. And slowly over time, as we learn more about the hereditary nature of the disease, that age cutoff has increased. And as I'm sure everyone in the crowd knows, uh, the GOC did release a statement in January of 2017 um, advocating for no woman left behind. So any woman with a new diagnosis of epithelial ovarian cancer being eligible for universal um, genetic testing. And so though that precedent has been set, uh, we're not doing as good a job perhaps now at meeting that, <coughs> uh, that goal. So the literature would suggest now that about 20 to 30 percent of women are actually being referred. And when we looked at our crude data over a 10-year period here in Nova Scotia, we were hitting about 26 percent. So it, to try and address this, in May of 2016, we introduced a new model of care here in Nova Scotia, whereby we had one of our genetic counselors from our local genetic testing service actually come and attend our tumor board rounds every single week. And as pathology was being reviewed and new cases of epithelial ovarian cancer identified, those women were then being flagged as eligible for referral, and our genetic counselor was then responsible for orchestrating that appointment uh, to genetics, ideally within two weeks, of the first visit to our gynae oncology team. And so the objectives of this study were to first and foremost look at the efficacy of that referral system and see whether we were actually improving our referral rates. And secondarily, now that we were making this decision to refer patients up front at the first point of contact, we wanted to make sure that that was in keeping with their goals of care. This was a two-part study. Uh, the first was a retrospective chart review using two local databases. So we do have our own Gynion database here, um, as well as our own um, Maritime Medical Genetics database. And we uh, derived all uh, women who um, had been diagnosed with a new epithelial ovarian cancer between January 1st, 2012 to December 31st, 2017. We excluded anyone with a non-epithelial ovarian cancer or those who had a low uh, malignant potential tumor. And we also collected data on a variety of other variables, uh, the dates and their, their age at diagnosis, what sort of treatment they had, whether they had a recurrence, um, any sort of personal family history that was captured within those databases. And then the second part of our, um, our study was now that we had identified this cohort of women, we developed um, an electronic questionnaire using an interface called REDCap and um, d devised a number of questions that asked about uh, wh whether patients thought they had been referred to genetics, what their experience was like, what their preferences were around timing. And we mailed the link to this study out in a study letter to all of our eligible participants. Um, obviously, those that were deceased at the time of our study mail out uh, were excluded from our original population. And we did get um, RAB approval from our local Nova Scotia Health Authority for the study. This is just a sampling of some of the items from the red cap, so I won't go through them in detail just in the interest of time, but you can read them there. We did um, ask about, again, patient preference for timing for genetic testing, if they attended an appointment, what made them want to attend, or if they declined their appointment, what were some of the reasons for declining. And we also asked a couple knowledge translation questions about whether they felt they had been diagnosed with a mutation, what they understood about that process and about that diagnosis. Our primary outcome was our referral rate post-implementation of our new model of care. 
and secondarily, the preferred time for referral to genetics. <coughs> And we did use both chi-squared and Wilcon, uh, Wilcox on ranked some tests to look at both our demographic and clinical variables. So our results, we had a total population size of 386 women over that five-year time span. The mean age at diagnosis uh, was 65 years. And for the most part, majority of our participants were either a stage three or stage four at the time of diagnosis. We had a 59% rate of serous uh, subtype. And we had a, a deceased rate when it came time to actually mail it our study questionnaire of 43% of our overall population. We did unfortunately have 18 women as well for whom we couldn't ascertain their alive or deceased status. And so we did not mail out to them as well um, just for issues of patient sensitivity. 301 of our total sample size were diagnosed before May 1st. So before our, uh, our um, new model of care had been introduced. And overall, for all comers in that population, we had a referral rate to genetics of 51%. When we looked at those who had been referred uh, before implementation of our new model of care, our referral rate was 40%. And then when we looked after implementation of our new model of care, we actually saw a 48% increase in the population that we were capturing. And so our referral rate went up to 88%. And this is just, again, some data from that overall co cohort that had been referred, so that 51%. So the time from diagnosis to initial referral was on average 286 days. Um, overwhelmingly, most people were actually seen by genetics and went to their appointments, so we had a 90% um, uh, appointment attendance rate. 7% declined their appointment. The time from referral to first appointment was 70 days. And we found an overall mutation rate in this population of 8%, so a little bit lower than what the literature would suggest. However, we also tend to have um, a lower rate of SARAS here in Nova Scotia uh, and also a predominantly Caucasian population. And our variant of unknown significant defined rate was 7%. Um, overwhelmingly, most of the mutations identified were either BRCA1 or 2. We then performed some stratified analysis looking at the date of diagnosis as a predictive factor. And so if you were diagnosed before May 1st, so before our new model of care would have been implemented, the time from diagnosis to referral was 110 days. And following implementation of our model, we were able to, to get that number down to 36 days. Our time from referral to first appointment with genetics also declined from 73 days to 19 days. And both of those were statistically significant. And then we performed one further stratified analysis looking at referral time because we knew that a small proportion of women who had actually been diagnosed later or, or pre our implementation of, of the new model and may have been referred after that time point. Um, and our time from referral to first appointment again uh, decreased uh, from 99 to 38 days. We found our mutation find rate and our uh, variant of unknown significant rate were actually stable across both of our testing periods. With respect to the questionnaire, um, we mailed out to 203 women and had a response rate of fif roughly 51%. So we had 103 surveys returned. Um, most women were college education or higher, and 84% were Caucasian. 68% um, believed they had been referred to genetics, and 6% were unsure. And we had a very small proportion of women who had some discordancy between whether they had been referred or not and what they perceived um, had been their interaction with genetics. <coughs> And overwhelmingly, 97% attended their appointment if they were referred. For those that declined their appointment, the predominant reasons we uh, received back were that patients were concerned about potential risk on blood relatives or they were concerned about insurance. And when we asked participants what they felt was the best time to be referred to genetics, 70% um, of our population either wanted to be referred right up front at the time of diagnosis or with first initiation of treatment. So overall, we found a 48% increase in our referral rate to genetics by incorporating our genetic counselor as part of our multidisciplinary team. Our wait time from referral to first appointment decreased uh, by 67.8 days. And almost 70% of our population wished to be referred right up front at the time of diagnosis or with first initiation of treatment. And our mutation find rate was stable across both <coughs> cohorts. We obviously have some limitations to our work, so that we are a small site here in Nova Scotia with smaller numbers than would be seen at some of our larger sites. We do have a, a limited number of new diagnoses annually and, and unfortunately quite a high um, death rate. And so we did lose a large proportion of our population by the time we had gone to do our study mail out over that five year time point. We do have a predominantly Caucasian population here and so some of the questions regarding uh, patient preference 
preferences around uh, genetic testing and timing may be influenced uh, by that cultural and ethnic background. And again, with any sort of survey mail-out, we, are, we have, do have an inherent um, a susceptibility to response bias. We did only have a, a response rate of 51%. So in conclusion, we did feel our new model of care was quite successful in capturing a much larger cohort of women who would be eligible for testing. And we do want to highlight that women really do favor early contact with genetic services and want to be seen by them up front and early in the course of their uh, treatment. In terms of future directions, we are hoping to look at our data over a much longer time point because this data really just represents the first year or so after implementing this new model. We'd also like to take a look at our mutation rate, just because we are seeming to come in a little bit lower than what the literature would suggest is the actual mutation rate for most germline um, testing. And so we do want to look over time to see whether that is changing uh, as we're testing more women. And then we're also looking at potentially integrating some somatic testing and how that'll change our numbers as well. As these are all the very lovely um, co-investigators and authors on this project who put a lot of time and work into this, so I do want to take a moment to acknowledge all of their contributions as well. Um, and Dr. Kieser was our PI on this project. And I'm very happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Marcus. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in, in this work and, and, you know, the mutation rate you've identified, as you described it, being a little lower than anticipated, mm -hmm. kind of matches your, similar yeah, to, your to what we had. I guess one question I have is, in the strategy that you're taking, do you think you are even potentially overestimating even the lower number you have of BRCA mutations? Because we know in the general population, women with BRCA mutations will live longer than those that'll be wild type. Yeah, and so the strategy that you've taken by capturing people that are essentially living longer than, than those that died earlier, that that number may even be an overestimation of the overall population. Potentially, yeah. 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 You, you touched briefly on somatic testing. Uh, what's the status of somatic testing in, in Nova Scotia, and, and how do you plan to incorporate those folks who do test positive? That's a very loaded question. <laughs> um, I think right now it's, it's sort of in very preliminary stages. We, again, have quite a smaller number of patients overall, a smaller infrastructure here, so I think it's still very early on in for us. We have time for one last question. Well, uh, thank you. Réjean Savoie from New Brunswick. Uh, just a quick question, then uh, I don't want to embarrass you or anything, but this is for Nova Scotia patient, and you're doing a lot of testing right. for New Brunswick patient also. So does, what does it mean for New Brunswick patient? Would it be going faster, or would it improve that part group also, or just Nova Scotia patient? I would think it would improve for them as well, because we are sort of that potential catchment area for them. Now, no, New Brunswick has their own gynae oncology services as well. But um, I would hope that it would improve their referral rates and their time, timely access for them as well. Can I just add yeah, absolutely. to yes. that? Um, sorry, that, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, what it's meant for the Maritime Medical Genetic Service in total is that for PEI, uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia will have a faster turnaround time from referral. Overall. What doesn't reflect for the other provinces other than Nova Scotia is the increase in referral numbers. So we've done that as a provincial program uh, here in Nova Scotia through the Gynionks, Um And I would encourage the other provinces to do so. Any letters of recommendation that come out from our group would say that on the disposition notes. So I have uh, no disclosures, but I will be talking about the off-label use of uh, letrozole um, in this hypothetical model um, analysis. So low-grade serous ovarian cancer makes up only a small proportion, less than 10% of all cases of ovarian cancer that we encounter. Um, however, treatment paradigms are quite different than the more uh, prevalent histology, high-grade serous ovarian cancer, because of its slower growing nature the relative uh, resistance to platinum-based chemotherapy, um, as well as the increased um, prevalence of uh, estrogen and progesterone receptor expression in the low-grade histology. Um, but similar to advanced high-grade serous uh, cancer, advanced low-grade serous ovarian cancer is primarily treated with 
primary cytoreductive surgery, um, followed by adjuvant platinum-based uh, chemotherapy. And there have been several retrospective small-scale single institution studies that have shown that patients who um, undergo observation alone <coughs> after primary cytoreductive surgery and um, adjuvant chemotherapy have worse progression-free and overall survival than patients who had received uh, maintenance hormonal treatment. And the most commonly used agent in these studies was letrozole, an aromatase inhibitor, even though tamoxifen and other aromatase inhibitors had been used as well. It was a more um, mixed population. So the purpose of this study was to assess the cost effectiveness and the lifetime effects of um, maintenance therapy with letrozole in patients with treated advanced stage three low-grade serous ovarian cancer. My primary outcome was total lifetime cost and secondary outcomes were um, life years, over um, quality adjusted life years and um, number of first recurrences at five and at 10 years. Um, so probability, uh, utility, and cost data was mostly obtained from uh, the literature um, and was entered into a Markov simulation model. The base case was a 47-year-old uh, woman who had been <coughs> treated with primary cytoreductive surgery and adjuvant chemotherapy um, um, and was stage three and uh, who was <coughs> estrogen uh, receptor positive. The time horizon of the model was the lifetime of the patient, and uh, the time um, cycle was three months. So patients could move from one state, for example, being in remission with no sign of recurrence to having a recurrence every three months. A standard discounting rate of 3% was applied. So uh, what were these values that were entered in the model? So probabilities were mostly derived from the literature when available. Um, so things such as the probability of recurrence with observation alone, the probability of recurrence with uh, letrozole. Um, also probabilities of response to treatment. So probability of res um, com having complete response or progressive disease with chemotherapy or with hormonal, hormonal therapy, as well as probabilities of having adverse side effects. So the probability of having a um, serious um, complication from surgery or probability of having serious adverse events from chemotherapy or from letrozole therapy. Um, utility data was also extracted from the literature, but it was largely um, extrapolated from um, data on high-grade serous ovarian cancer, um, as well as from breast cancer literature specifically for the uh, letrozole um, arm. So a utility is a number that's, um, that can be between zero and one, and it's really reflective of a patient's health-related quality of life. Um, so someone who um, is um, undergoing chemotherapy will have a lower utility than someone who's, uh, let's say, on low-dose maintenance letrozole. And then direct medical costs were estimated using Canadian public health data sources like chi -Hi, as well as pharmacy formularies for medications, as well as previous literature. So this is just a simplified schematic of the model. Essentially, patients would enter the model after having had cytoreductive surgery and uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, and they were funneled into two arms. So there's an observation arm and an arm where patients were theoretic theoretically receiving um, uh, maintenance therapy with letrozole. Um, now, patients who were on letrozole were on letrozole until they stopped, either because of noncompliance, which you know can be quite high, um, because of side effects, or because they recurred. Uh, patients could, of course, recur in both arms, and when they did recur, um, the mo majority of patients would undergo secondary cytoreductive surgery followed by either chemotherapy or hormonal therapy, um, and a smaller percentage of patients who were not um, theoretically surgical candidates were treated with chemotherapy or hormonal therapy, but they could become surgical candidates at a later date. And what I wanted, uh, what I think is important to mention is that in the observation arm, if patients did not receive maintenance letrozole after their first treatment, they could be eligible if they were treated for their first recurrence for maintenance uh, treatment with hormonal therapy at a later date. Um, I modeled a first recurrence and a second recurrence, but for simplicity's sake, after a third recurrence, patients were entered into a palliative care state. So with the lifetime horizon, the associated lifetime cost of maintenance treatment with letrozole was $69,985, and that was the preferred treatment strategy with an um, incremental cost effectiveness ratio, or ICER, of $11,027 per quality adjusted life year and uh, $6,503 per life year. The model also um, showed that patients who, um, that um, maintenance treatment with letrozole resulted in a 
um, improvement of in life years of 1.6 um, on average per patient and 0 0.9 quality adjusted life years improvement per patient. I also ran a Monte Carlo micro simulation model with a theoretical um, cohort of 10,000 women with advanced low-grade serous ovarian cancer. And uh, what this showed is that um, treatment, maintenance treatment with letrozole would result in 35% um, reduction of first recurrences at five years and 18% reduction of first recurrences at 10 years, respectively. So this tornado sensitivity analysis basically shows all of the variables that our model was most sensitive to. And not surprisingly, these were the probability of non-compliance to letrozole, the probability of recurrence, of course, with observation alone or with letrozole treatment, the uh, probability of having residual disease after secondary cytoreductive surgery, and the probability of having severe adverse events to letrozole itself. However, when we ran a sensitivity analysis throughout the entire range of clinically plausible values that were derived from the literature, we found that letrozole was still found to be cost effective if we use a willingness to pay of $50,000, which is um, the lower margin of what's um, accepted in North America. This one-way sensitivity analysis varies the probability of non-compliance to letrozole, which again, we know from breast cancer literature that can be quite high. So what this shows is that as the probability of non-compliance to letrozole increases, the net monetary benefit from maintenance with letrozole decreases. Um, however, even at a non-compliance rate of 33%, uh, which was the highest that was um, uh, published in breast cancer literature, letrozole is still a little bit cost effective um, at the same willingness uh, to pay a 50,000 Canadian dollars. <coughs> oh, can I go back? Okay. So we also know that um, um, having any residual disease um, after secondary cytoreductive surgery is a very impo impo important prognostic factor for these patients. And um, so this sensitivity analysis varies the probability of, of having any residual disease. And what you can see is that as the probability of having any residual disease decreases, so does the net monetary benefit of treatment with letrozole. However, even if all patients have no residual disease at the end of secondary cytoreduction, letrozole is still a little bit cost effective. And finally, uh, this two-way sensitivity analysis varies um, the probability of recurrence, both with letrozole and with observation alone. And what I really wanted to show is that if we keep the probability of recurrence with observation at around 27% per year, which is what's derived from the literature, in order for letrozole maintenance to be cost effective, the probability of recurrence with letrozole per year should be 24% um, or less. So in conclusion, uh, maintenance letrozole is a cost-effective strategy in patients with treated low-grade serous or advanced low-grade serous ovarian cancer. Uh, resulting in clinically relevant improvement in um, quality adjusted life years, life years, and a decreased number of first recurrences. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. May for her guidance in this project and my other co investigators. Thank you. That was excellent, and thank you for keeping to time. Um, so obviously it's a very uh, sophisticated model, uh, but I think a lot of it obviously is based on you know, what sort of clinical information goes into the model. So what did you base your, um, so obviously uh, what studies did you use to inform this particular model? So um, the two main, I guess the, the most important ones would be um, the ones that have actually studied using uh, maintenance therapy with, uh, with a hormonal treatment. And the main two were um, Dr. Gersherson's study from MD Anderson as well as Dr. Amanda Fader's study. They were both published in um, 2017, one in JCO and one in the gynae oncology. Um, other uh, probabilities, like I said, um, were um, you know derived from um, either studies that had been published in high-grade serous uh, ovarian cancer, so things such as um, probabilities of uh, having adverse events after cytoreductive surgery, um, those were derived from Dr. Uh, Chu's um, studies. Um, I do have a, a long list, a long table of all the probability, utility, and cost data, uh, but there's a long list of studies, but I think those were the most, two most important. We have no financial relationships to disclose and we will not be disclose, uh, discussing any off-label or investigational use. 
So the objectives of this study are to describe hormone replacement therapy used amongst women who undergo premature iatrogenic surgical menopause and to be familiar with differences in physician visits and hospital admissions between hormone replacement therapy users and non-users for health conditions associated with premature menopause. Uh, my, pre my presentation has slightly changed since the um, slides were submitted, so we won't be discussing uh, the mortality, but I'm happy to answer any questions regarding to that subject at the end of the presentation. So premature surgical menopause without subsequent hormone replacement therapy has been associated with increased morbidity and mortality. Uh, for those of us in the room who are in the Lynch syndrome talk yesterday, uh, Dr. Altman uh, provided a nice um, background regarding this. Certainly we're familiar with morbidities being things such as cognitive dysfunction and even dementia, cardiovascular disease risk, um, osteoporosis and sexual dysfunction. Um, but uh, uh, menopause that is not supplemented with hormone replacement therapy has also been associated with mortality. So in the nurses' health study, one in eight deaths are attributed to oophorectomy before the age of 50 that is not supplemented with hormone replacement. Despite the fact that we know the downstream effects of premature menopause um, and the fact that hormone replacement therapy has been shown to be safe even in um, populations that may be deemed higher risk, such as BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers, um, estimated use of hormone replacement therapy after surgical menopause is quite low in the literature, uh, less than 50%. So we conducted a population-based cohort study in British Columbia um, looking at women who underwent a gynecological surgery from 2004 to 2014 using the medical service plan. So the medical service plan is the insurance, um, provincial insurance um, program um, that physicians bill. Um, so this uh, database was accessed uh, through POPBC, Population BC data. So we initially acquired over 63,000 women in this 10-year cohort who underwent gynecological surgeries. We excluded about 9,300 women who um, had a personal history of cancer. And then, of course, excluded women who were deemed to likely already be in uh, menopausal, so over the age of 49, and that was 8,700 women. So this uh, gave us a cohort of 14,000 women, um, less than or equal to the age of 49, who underwent either a bilateral sapingo oophorectomy or bilateral oophorectomy. And then to ensure that these women stayed in the province so that we could accurately track whether they filled their prescriptions or if they were prescribed hormone replacement therapy or not, we ensured that they had MSP coverage or health insurance coverage for over 275 days. So that was 12,837 women. And from there, we linked uh, this cohort of women uh, to the PharmaNet database, which is the provincial database that um, records all prescriptions that's filled um, in the province. So the median age of surgical menopause in this cohort was 43 years, and they're followed up for about six years' time. Um, as you can see from the top part of this table, a lot of these women were quite young. So about 30% um, were less than the age of 40. We looked at income quantiles that was available and that was about evenly distributed around 20%, and the majority of women were BRCA negative. We then looked at uh, further details regarding the surgeries that they underwent um, to undergo um, surgical menopause, and the majority of women, about 90%, underwent a bilateral salpingophorectomy. About half of them underwent a concurrent hysterectomy. And the leading indications for surgery were like um, were mostly benign reasons, so endometriosis, a benign tumor, abnormal bleeding, fibroids. However, there are a couple, uh, sorry, two, uh, three percent of women who underwent for prophylaxis reasons, whether they are a BRCA mutation carrier um, or other hereditary syndromes, um, and about two percent underwent the surgeries for uh, cancer, and the majority of women underwent a laparotomy. When we looked at if women had ever used a hormone placement therapy following their surgery, only about 55% had ever used it within this um, cohort, falling for about an average of six years. For those who, under, who use HRT, um, the higher proportion of them used um, estrogen only, and the duration of HRT wasn't very high, so about 48% uh, of women had used HRT for less than one year. We then also looked at health service use for comorbidities associated with premature menopause. <coughs> so we're mostly interested in things like cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis. Um, 
and other cancers such as colorectal and lung, stroke, and menopause. And as you can see, um, women who did not use hormone replacement therapy following surgical menopause had a higher proportion um, physician visits on an outpatient basis for cardiovascular um, disease reasons and osteoporosis reasons. Um, there were, and these were both statistically significant with p-values of less than 0.05. And as the duration of hormone replacement therapy increased, there was a trend of decreasing um, use of health services uh, for cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis. In terms of menopause, women who use hormone replacement therapy were actually more likely to see a physician for reasons for menopause. Uh, but I speculate this is likely because they were filling their prescriptions and returning to their physicians uh, regarding um, menopausal symptoms. Our cohort was quite young, so not very many women were actually admitted to the hospital during the follow-up period. Um, but as you can see, these were not statistically significant, but again, women who did not use hormone replacement therapy following surgical menopause um, had higher uh, rates of admissions for both cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis. We did some analysis looking at some subpopulations of interest. So this was looking at BRCA mutation carriers. So as you recall, only about 1% of our population actually had a BRCA mutation. So this was 118 women. The median age of surgical menopause was 41. 99% underwent a bilateral slapping-go-oophorectomy, and a third underwent a con uh, concomitant hysterectomy. Um, a higher proportion of them, compared to the entire cohort, had used um, hormone replacement therapy after menopause at 86%. And again, a higher number of them had used hormone replacement therapy for a longer duration of um, at least a year at, seven, at almost 70%. And 65% had used um, estrogen only. For those who underwent ophorectomy for reasons of malignancy, uh, there were 212 women. Median age of menopause was 43 and a half years, and 92% underwent a bilateral slapping ophorectomy. Over half underwent a concurrent hysterectomy, and about half of them had ever used hormone placement therapy. Not very many of them went on to use hormone placement therapy for more than a year, and about a quarter of them had used estrogen only. So I think there are some several strengths and limitations that are um, of note in this study. Uh, to our knowledge, it's the largest study to date looking into a, a population of surgical menopause, uh, women who undergo surgical menopause and hormone replacement therapy. We used a large population-based cohort with very, uh, quite inclusive, not very many um, exclusion criteria. And as we were able to uh, receive the data from a medical service plan, uh, we were able to capture all, essentially all women in British Columbia who underwent surgical menopause. PharmaNet in British Columbia has been recording prescription records in British Columbia since 1986, so it's pretty comprehensive in being able to capture all hormone replacement therapy use. With that said, we used administrative databases that were not initially used for research, so some variables that may be of interest were not captured. And again, we use prescription records as a surrogate for drug use. I suppose it is possible that some women fill the prescription and never used it. Probably less likely are women who were using hormone replacement therapy from a, a practitioner such as a, a, a naturopath that was not recorded um, in PharmaNet, um, but that is a limitation. And we had a relatively short uh, follow-up of only six years. So in conclusion, about only half of women who undergo premature surgical menopause in British Columbia had ever used hormone replacement therapy, and the majority of them were for less than a year, and a higher number of uh, physician visits for both osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease was noted amongst women who did not use hormone replacement therapy. And I think um, our study kind of highlights the importance of educating our patients who undergo menopause about the importance of hormone replacement therapy and their care after surgery and um, ongoing follow-up to ensure that their questions are answered and um, concerns regarding adherence um, are addressed um, in this uh, young population. Uh, so I'd like to thank um, our co-authors on this po uh, project, Population Data BC, for providing the data sets and the BC Cancer Surgery Network for their support on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very interesting data. I'm thinking that probably you should be giving this talk to the group upstairs because, uh, I mean, only 1.7% of the cases involved cancer. I mean, obviously there's tumors that we think could be cancer or uteri that we think could be sarcomas, but that's, that's quite striking. Um, so what's your recommendation then around oophorectomy in these cases? Do you, do you think in some of these cases that they could have been avoided, or do you think they were truly indicated? Um, it, and then, I mean, I think that's one of the limitations of our study, because we don't have actual individual case um, 
records in terms of what the imaging show, what the workup was, what was the reasoning behind the physicians to know exactly um, to comment on that. Um, but I think one thing to remind, and I did kind of this presentation at our academic day with um, a lot of generalists, was um, kind of the importance of ensuring that the patients get followed up with um, hormones if they do undergo a nephrectomy. Great. Diane. Uh, always wanting to torture our own fellows. <laughs> no, just kidding. Great talk, uh, Jan. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is a little bit along the same line, but with a slightly different twist, because a lot of those ovaries came out based on recommendations from GYN Oncology that we can prevent ovarian cancer by doing um, prophylactic or doing a, a BSO. And, you know, the number has changed over the years for over the age of 40, over the age of 45, et cetera. Do you think it's... Um, our specialty's responsibility to communicate with the general gynecologist that perhaps we're not preventing ovarian cancer by taking out the ovaries, number one, and then furthermore, um, to make a decision as to whether it's ethical to take out normal ovaries in the perimenopausal period. Yeah, so I think it's. Tr I think we do have a responsibility, especially when a journalist consults us about a mass. You know, should I just do a cystectomy? Do I leave it alone? Do I do a nephrectomy? And certainly, I think educating women about the role of really salpingectomy and preventing fallopian tubes slash ovarian slash peritoneal uh, cancers is important. Uh, we did look at the trend of BSOs and BOs um, in the ten-year cohort, and essentially, it didn't really change. So um, I think that uh, again illustrates the importance of um, our um, role to educate journalists about the importance of leaving or the ethics of leaving ovaries um, that, you know, are not very compelling to remove in women who are, um, who are young. Great question. Hi, thanks. Great talk. Uh, a bit Thank more you. of a technical question. I'm just curious how you uh, categorize the indication for surgery if women had, say, multiple, you know, endometriosis, abnormal uterine bleeding, just using your data, how did you classify indication like that? Yeah, so a lot of women actually did, didn't have multiple um, indications. Most of them were actually quite clean, which was actually surprising to myself and, and Nimisha, who I did a lot of her data management. That was probably less than 100 women who had those indications. So for those women, what we actually did was if there was a mix, if there was a combination of a malignant reason and a benign reason, then we coded them as malignant. Marcus. I'm not sure if you have this in your data set, but um, you know, the patient population that we struggle with are young women that have endometrial cancer. Um, we're obviously reluctant to give them hormones, but they're likely cured, the mass majority of them, with the operation that we did. Mm -hmm. Do you have any data on those patients or that young patient population on going on hormones? Um, so we don't really have by sight, unfortunately, of the cancer. So the, of the 2% women in our cohort who had cancers, we don't really know exactly which site they had it. It was just malignancy. Um, so these are my disclosures. I uh, have received a, a research support from AstraZeneca Canada. Um, I will not be discussing any off-label and or investigational use of any medications in my presentation. Um, the learning objectives of my first one are, I mean, I have three slides in three minutes, so pretty simple, just to discuss the cost-utility analysis of BRCA genetic testing of women with ovarian cancer in a Canadian setting specifically. Um, so we've covered this in a few talks already today, but as far as the impact of BRCA testing of our ovarian cancer patients, that has changed um, in recent years quite a bit. So now BRCA mutation status uh, matters quite a bit for treatment decisions, um, in addition to um, the previous uh, benefit in allowing testing and risk reduction uh, in their relatives. Um, so there have been several previous cost effectiveness analysis of bracket testing of women with ovarian cancer. Um, generally these have, or not generally, they, from what I could find, they've only focused on either cascade testing of family members and the benefit derived from that, or it's used to target PARP inhibitor therapy, um, but not both. Um, also there's um, never been one done in a Canadian setting. Uh, so the aim of my uh, analysis was to do a cost-effectiveness analysis of bracket testing of ovarian cancer patients, um, including both cascade <laughs> testing of their family members uh, with risk reduction um, and also for targeting PARP inhibitor therapy in the maintenance setting, and this was specifically done in a Canadian setting. Um, so I did a hybrid model, a semi-Markov model. Uh, the Markov uh, assumption was relaxed to allow memory uh, in the Markov um, uh, states. Um, there, the strategies I included were testing of all women with high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma versus no testing. 
Um, and again, like I said, this incorporated the cast aid testing of first degree uh, female relatives, um, and uh, as well as PARP inhibitor therapy in their current setting of the index patients. Um, the perspective was a Canadian payer perspective. The time horizon was lifetime with annual cycles. Um, the Canadian inputs uh, included um, were, were many. This included all costs um, adjusted to 2018 Canadian dollars. Um, all of the background probabilities of death by age, age-specific probability of death uh, from ovarian and breast cancer, um, from Statistics Canada uh, data, age-specific rates of ovarian and breast cancer, again, from Statistics Canada, and um, age and specific background uh, utilities from some Canadian studies that have been done. Um, and as well, other things from uh, CAIHI and uh, Statistics Canada about the age of index patients, the number and ages of siblings and daughters, and that kind of a thing. Um, key assumptions included, um, I, I assumed a 70% probability of a BRCA mutation in high-grade serous ovarian cancer. I assumed that 100% of those who were eligible would use PARP inhibitors uh, in, in that setting. Um, those who remained in a cancer state for five years were then considered cured after that point. I didn't allow for any second cancers in the model, so if somebody had ovarian cancer they, and were cured, they wouldn't then go on to have breast cancer or vice versa. Um, and importantly, I actually didn't uh, model an overall survival benefit with PARP inhibitor, but a progression-free survival benefit. Sensitivity analysis which was deterministic. Um, so key results uh, in the base case, um, in uh, the testing strategy, um, th there was an increased cost as well as an increased benefit. So the incremental increased cost was uh, $15,500 and an increase uh, in qualities of 0.25. And this resulted in an ICER of uh, just over $62,000. Um, I did model for what I call the ideal scenario, in which 100% of those who are eligible in their current setting would use PARP inhibitors. Um, the uptake of uh, testing by first degree relatives was 100%, because in, in the base case, that, that wasn't actually 100%. I, I took uh, data, um, um, uh, uh, took data to that modeled it was, it was much less than that, actually. Um, and then also 100% uptake of risk-reducing surgery by first-degree relatives. And in that ideal case scenario, that ICER dropped significantly down to 20, just over $25,000. Um, I then looked at how many cancers were prevented and how many cancer-related deaths were prevented. So in the base case uh, analysis per individual tested in the Canadian population, uh, sorry, per individual tested, there was 0.02 ovarian cancers, 0.02 breast cancers, and 0.02 um, cancer-related deaths prevented. And modeling... Um, uh, the sort of 2,800, uh, I'm sorry, uh, new cases of ovarian cancer that was projected in 2017 and accounting for about 75% of them being high-grade serous ovarian cancers. That would equal about 30 ovarian cancers, 30 breast cancers, and 30 cancer-related deaths in the Canadian population. In that ideal scenario, um, that increased to 0 0.04, 0 0.06, and 0 0.05 per individual tested, which would work out to about 84 ovarian cancers, 126 breast cancers, and 105 cancer-related deaths. In the sensitivity analysis, there were some other interesting things that came up when I changed the model to forget about PARP inhibitors um, and 100% uptake of testing by um, first-degree relatives, which is how some um, older models have been done. The no testing scenario was actually dominated, and what that means, it was actually more expensive and less effective. Um, and um, interestingly, when I adjusted the, um, the pretest probability of a BRCA mutation in high-grade serous ovarian cancer patient, um, the testing strategy itself was dominated at BRCA prevalences of less than 16 point, or less than or equal to 16.5%, which isn't, which isn't that low. Um, so uh, essentially, um, um, my model has shown that um, uh, uh, routine uh, BRCA testing of all high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma patients in Canada is cost-effective depending on the, th the, the willingness to pay threshold that you use in Canada. That's anywhere between $50,000 and $100,000 generally. Um, it has decreased quite a bit from previous analyses that have been done in other settings that generally run from $125,000 to two, up to $200,000. Um, and importantly, the model was very sensitive to um, steps that were taken to prevent future ovarian cancers, um, like uh, testing of first-degree relatives and uh, risk-reducing intervention in first-degree relatives. So um, we, we can't forget that important bit of this uh, type of genetic testing, particularly in the Canadian setting where we're all now uh, jumping on board of somatic testing and tumor testing. Um, the testing of, of family members is still extremely important in this in this situation. Okay, thank you. And that's it. So we're going to... Just in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next presentation from Vanessa. Um, 
So impact of gynecologic oncology clinic initiated BRCA testing on patient pathways and resource utilization in southern Alberta. Um, so my disclosures are the same. My learning objectives are fairly similar. Um, this was another project we did uh, in Calgary. Um, so we introduced um, what's generally known as a mainstreaming model of genetic testing for ovarian cancer patients. Um, and this was sort of, uh, again, on the background of there's an identified need for um, uh, uh, catching more patients with bracket testing um, and getting results earlier. And this is because in, the more we know, the more we've increased that pretest probability of BRCA mutations in our high-grade serous ovarian cancer population or the non mucinous epithelial ovarian cancers with PARP inhibitors. And we now, the results matter for treatment, so we need them faster. Um, and again, like was mentioned earlier, up to 50% or so of, of these patients don't have a suggestive personal or family history. Um, so there's a big push to, to catch uh, more people in this testing. So in 2016, we introduced a mainstream model of BRCA testing uh, in Calgary. We called this Go BRCA. Um, mainstreaming um, is something that's been talked about a little bit before. It's uh, been mainly sort of um, really pushed or, or developed uh, in the UK at the Royal Marsden. Um, and they've published a number of papers on this. And there's a few other groups in Australia, um, another group in the UK, um, and the states that have published on this. But essentially what mainstreaming is, is moving the pre-testing uh, genetic counseling or pre-counseling component into the oncology clinic. So what we've done is, is uh, the clinical geneticists have allowed us, the gynae oncologists, to do the pre-testing counseling of our patients right in our clinic. They and then proceed straight from our clinic down the hall to get their blood drawn for testing. Um, and then when the results come back, the post-results counseling is still done by clinical genetics. Um, so our aim was to just evaluate how uh, the mainstream has impacted referral rates, uptakes, timelines, patient encounters, and resource utilization uh, in southern Alberta. Um, uh, because of this, or it was a retrospective cohort study. We included all patients who were diagnosed with high-grade serous ovarian cancer and treated at the Tom Baker Cancer Center um, in 2014, and then versus uh, from uh, January 2016 to March 2017. Uh, the reason it ended in March 2017 is because after that we introduced panel testing, um, and we were trying to kind of keep it clean from that. Um, exclusion criteria was anyone attested through a private or uh, private clinic or lab or commercial service, expedited testing, anyone from out of province. We do see uh, patients, quite a few patients from British Columbia and Saskatchewan as well, and they had to be excluded because they're not actually eligible to, to go through this program. Um, there was a lot of uh, different data abstracted, um, demographics and treatment data outcomes, referrals, and um, importantly, all the dates of their counseling, who did the counseling, the uptake, uh, their results, and, and all that kind of thing. Um, so... We had uh, about 57 patients in the 2014 cohort and 89 in the GoBraca cohort. We actually found um, quite high rates um, uh, compared to the literature out there for referral, even our baseline group. So we actually had referred 93% of those patients, and that was at the 42-month median follow-up time. In the GoBraca cohort, we had actually referred 86% in 18 uh, months of median uh, follow-up. Um, what we did find is that we had a, a significant decrease in our time from the diagnosis of their cancer to us getting their or their results, the genetic results getting reported. So from just under 500 days down to 258. We looked at this a couple different ways. Um, as far as how many patients we were catching and what proximity to their diagnosis, in the previous group we had no patients uh, with a genetic result within six months of their diagnosis, and that. Uh, went up to 26% or uh, you know a quarter of them um, in the GoBraca cohort. Uh, within 12 months, we increased that to almost 80% uh, from 20%, um, and within 18 months, uh, and almost you know 92% um, uh, up from 59%. These are all statistically significant. Um, we did also look at um, how many we had actually caught before their recurrence, um, in keeping with the current setting that we can use PARP inhibitors in uh, in Canada at the moment, um, and we had increased that from about half. Uh, to, uh, to about 75, 76%. Um, so this is another model of, um, of trying to uh, increase referral rates of bracket testing, uptake rates, and, and, um, and timeliness of results. Um, it's been done elsewhere. It's been very successful elsewhere as, as well as in Calgary, so it's something to consider. I have no financial relationships to disclose and uh, no off-label uh, use to report. So there is extensive evidence demonstrating the safety and efficacy of exercise interventions in the oncology population to counteract the adverse physical and psychological effects of cancer and its treatment. There is evidence to support benefit of exercise for patients throughout the treatment course, but specifically for patients with, uh, sorry, for the preoperative patient in the uh, prehab 
context, uh, which has been shown to reduce post-operative length of stay and complications and improve functional recovery. Um, it's also been demonstrated to be effective in reducing treatment-related fatigues associated uh, with chemotherapy, among other side effects, and for patients with obesity as a component of weight management strategy and for patients um, with <coughs> metabolic disease. This pilot study uh, recruited ambulatory gynecologic oncology patients. They were counseled, given written information, and received a follow-up phone call. The intervention was a one-hour high-intensity functional exercise class with a short evidence-based nutrition discussion twice per week in a community gym facility approximately 10 minutes from the referring hospital. Patient demographics, attendance, patient reported quality of life, and functional outcomes as well as qualitative feedback were recorded. 17 of the 45 patients referred attended the class, and 9 of the 17 who attended attended four or more classes with a range of 4 to 47 classes attended. The most common reason for not returning were medical issues or distance from the facility. The most common reason for attending the class was a recommendation from their oncologist. Only two patients attended prior to receiving a follow-up call. Prior activity level among participants was minimal. The median age was 56 and the median BMI was 29. Seven patients had a BMI in the obese range. Participants either had endometrial or ovarian cancer and were both in the primary and recurrent setting. Participants attended most commonly in the perioperative setting or during or after chemotherapy. Quality of life and functional outcomes were best predicted by their treatment regimen at the time of scoring. Patients were uh, provided qualitative feedback and three general themes were identified. <coughs> the first theme was control and empowerment. Patients said things like, it was one of the few things I could do for myself to try to keep some control over this terrifying journey. I was able to push harder than I thought I could to keep going for a few extra laps or repetitions or try more weights. I now know I can handle more than I thought possible, not just in class, but in life. I'm still overweight, but I feel more able to take steps to be more active and healthy in the coming years. I never thought I could jog or do sit-ups or do squats or lift weights, and now I know that I can. The second theme identified was physical preparedness for treatment. One patient said, my surgery was two weeks ago and I feel strong. I walked myself out of the hospital and I was released because I knew I could do it. I walked up my stairs with confidence when I got home because the sh program showed me how strong I am. The third theme I identified was um, um, emotional support from other patients. This class let me come together with other women who have similar diagnoses, but in a way that let us concentrate on our wellness and strength, not on our illness or in a clinical setting where we depend on others to fix us. There was room to talk about setbacks or challenges that any of us may have, but the focus was on working out and improving our health while quiet support was in the background. So the conclusions were that sustained attendance was seen in 50% of participants, and it had a significant impact on patient-reported experience. This type of program is therefore feasible and demonstrates the integration of a lifestyle intervention into gynecologic cancer care. A larger study with a control group may demonstrate further advantages with respect to patient outcomes and experience. Great, thank you. Uh, so, you know, we certainly recognize that uh, prehab is a very important component um, in, in our patients. We included that recently in our update to the ERAS guidelines, uh, but we recognize there's quite a significant gap in the literature currently. Um, where do you see this study going in terms of addressing some of those uh, gaps around reduction in length of stay and so on? Um, well, I think this, this demonstrates that it, it is um, ideal to have something that we can actually recommend to our patients. So one of, you know, the most common phrases that we as physicians say is, you know, eat less and exercise more, but it's really not very helpful to patients. If we have something that we can actually um, recommend that patients attend that, that um, we are endorsing or supporting, I think it's a lot more effective and patients are much more likely to actually um, engage. In the prehab setting, um, there is evidence for home-based um, uh, physical activity models as well, and I think most of the prehab uh, data is based on that, but patients seem to really enjoy participating with and engaging with other patients. Um, and the, the pre-op setting is really an interesting time because it's a very high anxiety time for patients where they're just waiting for their surgery. And for those who are relatively asymptomatic, like endometrial cancer patients, for example, I think it's a really nice time for them to uh, do something evidence-based that's positive for their health and gives them that sense of control over the process. Great, Tama. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I wonder if you have data on what's the minimum amount of time for prehab to be effective um, and how that would apply to patients who have high-risk features where their surgery is relatively soon after their diagnosis. 
Yeah, so most of the prehab interventions are really um, relatively short intervals that would be compatible with our three to four week um, time period before surgery. Um, a lot of the data does come out of the oncology population, and so um, uh, those time frames are short. Um, there's a big 12-center, uh, 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 multi-center Canadian study that is just being started out of Ottawa, um, being run by an anesthesiologist, and it's specifically in the oncology population, so we will have some good uh, prehab data coming out soon on that. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I have no disclosures. By the end of the session, you will be able to be familiar with the factors associated with same-day discharge at a center where most gynecological oncology surgeries are performed laparoscopically, and be able to describe the relationship between obesity and same-day discharge. A significant portion of the cost savings from minimally invasive surgery arises from the decreased length of stay. Studies have demonstrated that same-day discharge is feasible and safe among the gynecologic oncology population uh, undergoing minimally invasive surgery. There's some evidence that obese patients are less likely to go home the same day, but there's not a lot of evidence um, specifically examining the relationship between same-day discharge and obesity. We conducted a retrospective cohort study of all patients who underwent minimally invasive surgery by a gynecologist oncologist at Trillium Health Partners between 2012 and 2016. We categorized the patients as non-obese, obese, and morbidly obese. We conducted univariate and multivariable logistic regression analysis on the entire population, um, as well as the obese subgroup to examine factors associated with same-day discharge. There were 496 patients in total, 288 non-obese, 161 obese, and 47 morbidly obese patients. 37% um, overall had same-day discharge. There were 44% of non-obese patients, 30% of obese, and only 15% of morbidly obese patients went home the same day. Importantly, patients who presented to the emergency department within 30 days of discharge were less likely to have had same-day discharge with an odds ratio of 0.48. Controlling for confounders, obese patients, which includes obese and morbidly obese patients, had a 46% lower odds of same-day discharge than their non-obese counterparts. Looking at the multivariable analysis for same-day discharge among all patients, the factors that were negatively associated with same-day discharge were obesity with an odds ratio of 0.54, procedure length in hours with an odds ratio of 0.51, and ASA score with an odds ratio of 0.63. The only thing that was positively associated with same-day discharge was being pre-booked by your surgeon for same-day discharge with an odds ratio of 9.16. Looking at the multivariable analysis for same-day discharge among the obese subgroup, the only two significant predictors of same-day discharge were procedure length with an odds ratio of 0.47, and again being pre-booked for same-day discharge with an odds ratio of 9.67. In conclusion, obesity was associated with a 46% lower odds of same-day discharge when contro controlling for confounders, suggesting that obese patients are less suitable candidates for same-day discharge than their non-obese counterparts. Pre-booking for same-day discharge was strongly associated with successful same-day discharge in the overall population and the obese subgroup, but obviously this is a variable with significant selection bias. It is possible that pre-booking patients for same-day discharge makes it more likely that they'll go home the same day by setting patient and care provider expectations, um, and this is something that could be further investigated in a future study by pre-booking all patients undergoing minimally invasive surgery for same-day discharge and then examining the, va examining the variables um, that kept them in hospital. Thank you. Question. Yes, hi. Um, did you find any relation between sleep apnea in these patients? I know some anesthesiologists might want to keep the patient for longer overnight <clears throat> to monitor them for that. So that's a really good question. Unfortunately, we don't have the specific comorbidities um, that the patients had, so we kind of had to use ASA score and other sort of substitute variables to represent that. Um, it is something that as surgeons, just anecdotally, I know that we tend to book patients for an overnight stay if they have sleep apnea, and I know that they tend to stay longer, but I don't have the specific numbers for that. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie. I'm uh, one of the residents at UBC, so I want to thank the committee for having me and for facilitating my speaking because I was a little bit late because of a flight. So thanks, everyone, for your attention. So um, 
I'm talking today about outcomes of adjuvant therapy and advanced stage endometrial cancer. So I don't have any um, disclosures. Um, so as we all know, uh, Lynch syndrome is a hereditary cancer syndrome, uh, which is characterized by uh, mismatch repair uh, deficiencies. Um, so in colorectal cancers, what they've seen in the advanced stages where they're using uh, endome or sorry, um, chemo radiation therapy is that they're noticing that they, uh, there's increased um, outcomes in terms of progression-free survival as well as overall survival. So this has been seen in the colorectal cancer, and we decided to have a little bit of a closer look at our local data in terms of endometrial cancer. So our, our hypothesis is that endometrial cancer patients with Lynch syndrome who receive adjuvant chemotherapy and or radiation therapy survive longer than those in the, the general population to historic controls. And so we're looking at our, per, our personal population at, at Vancouver General Hospital and UBC. Um, so our study cohort are women who are identified to have uh, genetically proven Lynch syndrome through the hereditary cancer um, program. Um, so there was 48 women who were identified, and then we selected particularly those who are at stage 3 or stage 4 or at stage 1, 2 with high-risk features who received chemo or radiation therapy. So our cohort was 21 people who met our inclusion criteria. Three of these patients were stage 4B. Um, the median survival was 53 months, um, and then in a very rudimentary Kaplan-Meier curve, there was approximately 66% uh, survival at 4.75 years, and this is compared to stage 4B in the general population, which is approximately 15% at five years. In terms of stage three, they were predominantly stage 3C. Um, there was five uh, patients that were identified. The median survival was 83 years, and this is an 80% survival in approximately five years. Um, sorry, 80% in five years, and this is compared to the 50 to 58 um, percent seen in the general population. And then there is 11 stage one and two. Um, the median survival in stage one was 69% or 69 patients. Uh, 69 months, sorry, and then in stage two, it was 54 months, and there was uh, no um, deaths in that population of those 11 during our study period, and that is compared to the 80% five-year survival in the general population. This is a um, visual representation of that data. So there, the limitations of our study um, is that it's a small sample size because the uh, Lynch syndrome is rare as well as advanced stage endometrial cancer is rare. And because of the small sample size, we couldn't really separate out whether this was um, chemotherapy versus uh, radiotherapy that was causing the difference or the um, increased survival that we saw. So I think further study is warranted, but there does appear to be longer progression-free and overall survival in women with Lynch syndrome and endometrial cancer who are treated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy in the small study that we did, just to look at our hypothesis, uh, our hypothesis and validate it. Thank you very, thank you very much. So um, we do have uh, time for a question or two. Um, so I, I think I, I have one. So I think we heard a presentation this morning in the stage one mm -hmm. population that having a deficiency in the mismatch repair uh, had a worse outcome. And I yeah. think now we're hearing, I guess, in the advanced stage that has a better outcome. Maybe I if think you can... it's, um, sorry, the thing that I should mention is that the theory behind it is that the chemotherapy radiation therapy can damage the tumor cells. And then they don't have the, the because of the inherent mechanism of the MMR, they're unable to repair themselves. So they have further apoptosis as compared to other tumor cells who do not have Lynch syndrome. So the difference is in the fact that they have received a therapy that damages the cells. Excellent. 